Hello and good evening. Welcome to this evening's edition of Public Affairs Public Access. I'm your guest host, uh, David Hutzelman. You may be seeing this live on uh, today on February 22nd, but uh, you also may be seeing it on a rebroadcast mode. We'll be trying to take some questions from later on in the show from our, uh, for our guest here. Uh, I'm on about uh, once a month and uh, try to bring you items of local interest to the general Houston community and maybe to uh, the libertarian community in particular. And uh, tonight, uh, we're very pleased to have with us a, uh, a guest uh, to talk about the uh, topic of uh, intellectual property, which has uh, certainly gotten its way into the uh, public discourse because of some legislation uh, that's uh, appeared in Congress and also some of the events that are going on in the uh, in the third world mostly uh, in uh, regarding China and India and some uh, some of the intellectual property provisions so my guest tonight is uh, Stephen Kinsella uh, Stephen is the founder and executive office uh, editor of uh, libertarian papers he's the founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom you'll see that website on the uh, uh, monitor a little bit later. He's a member of the editorial board of Reason Papers and a general counsel for Applied Opto Electronics, where he's a registered patent attorney and a former adjunct professor at South Texas School of Law. He's a senior fellow with the Mises Institute, and he has uh, published numerous articles and books on uh, intellectual property law, international law, the application of libertarian principles to uh, legal topics. He received an LLM in International Business Law from King's College in London, a JD from the Paul M. Herbert Hebert <laughs> Law Center, right. Law Center at LSU, and a BSEE and MSEE degree from LSU. Welcome, Stephen, and thank you for uh, Stefan, and thank you for uh, being with us this evening. Thanks, glad to be here, David. Okay, uh, since uh, many of our viewers may not be familiar in detail with what intellectual property really uh, comprises, maybe you could give us a a brief rundown on, uh, on on what the term intellectual property means. Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, and probably until recently, it's a fairly esoteric and boring area for, for most people, but it's taken on increasing importance lately with the importance of the Internet and with increasing attempts by the government to regulate the Internet in the name of intellectual property. Intellectual property is a fairly recent term that is used by lawyers and legal scholars and the government to classify different discrete areas of the law, primarily patents and copyrights and as well as some other areas. So intellectual property is a sort of umbrella term that describes patent, copyright, trademark, trade secret, and some other types of laws. Laws that deal with protecting what is called creations of the mind or the intellect. Um, although some of these laws have somewhat uh, different uh, uh, bases and purposes, they're all lumped together this way. Um, the big two that are of concern in our modern economy are patent and copyright. Patents protect property rights and inventions, mousetraps, computer software, and copyright protects uh, artistic creations like novels, paintings, movies, things like this. Okay, very good. And uh, the current uh, legal system, I, as I understand it, you can uh, get a patent uh, protection for uh, what 17 years about 17 invent, years that's right and if somebody else uh, does something to create or make money from an idea that presumably is covered by your patent then you can sue them for damages or yes. cause them to cease and desist yes the, the way the patent system works is um, to obtain a patent you have to apply for one copyright by by contrast since 19 the 80s is automatic if you write uh, down on your note paper right now, a paragraph, you instantly have a copyright in even that. Even if I uh, disavow a copyright? Even, you can't disavow it. There's no way to get rid of it. Oh, okay. okay. You don't have to put a copyright notice. You don't have to register it with the copyright office. Um, patents, but you have to apply for a patent. Um, the requirement for a copyright is that you be the original author, the author of something original. That's all it has to be. Uh, for a patent, you have to be the inventor of a useful, and non-obvious and new 
uh, machine or process that does something useful and practical. Hmm. Okay, and do I understand that the uh, copyright laws uh, used to be shorter, but now there's something like uh, what the life of the author plus 70 years yeah, see, or something it, like but, that? Yeah, the, the average life of a copyright nowadays is over 100 years because of this provision. Um, originally at the founding of the United States, which had sort of the first modern copyright and patent system right at the founding of our Constitution in 1789, and soon after that with the first copyright and patent statutes, um, they both lasted roughly 14 years, and you could extend it for maybe another 14 years with, with copyright. And interestingly, the reason for the 14-year term, the idea was that um, we need to protect people from competition. Now, this is not a free market idea, protecting people from competition, but the idea is that if you invest in uh, a new process or uh, you come up with a new uh, uh, plot for a movie, or of course back then it wasn't a movie, but you know a new novel uh, or a play, you need to be protected from competition for the length of two consecutive apprenticeship terms. Oh, yeah. Now, apprentices served about seven, seven years each, so, so it's obviously an arbitrary number. Um, this derived from about three, four hundred years before in England and Europe, where the practice of the monarch and the crown granting patents to protect favored uh, courtesans, uh, uh, cronies of the court from competition. For example, in England, um, uh, the crown would grant a monopoly to someone or a patent for the manufacture of playing cards. Now, the person who got this monopoly didn't invent playing cards. They were just the ones who had the sole right to make them. And then they would actually be able to call upon the crown to send the crown's police into competitor stores to search their playing cards to make sure they had the right seal on them to make sure they weren't counterfeit. By counterfeit just means without the government's approval. Sounds very much like mercantilism. Is that, uh, it's not just mercantilism, it's what's going on right now <laughs> when you have the RIAA, the music industry, and the Motion Picture Association in the U.S. is getting, uh, uh, they're getting laws and regulations from the federal and even state governments that gives them the power to use state police to go invade, uh, you know, allegedly counterfeit CD makers or DVD makers to see, make sure that they're not making something uh, that's not approved by the state. I see. Let me go down a, a list of things which, uh, you know, may come to our viewers' <coughs> minds as to intellectual property, and you can tell me what laws they might be currently uh, covered under. What about uh, music and songs? Music and songs would be copyright. Okay, those they're are copyright They're creative laws. and artistic. Okay. Uh, movies? Uh, again, that's copyright. Okay. How about software? Software is covered uh, uh, by both patent and copyright. It didn't used to be covered by either one, but because of court decisions, they have said that there's an artistic aspect to the way you express computer code. Um, so the way the code is written is They're like, like the a block writing. diagram or something. No, That's not even the block diagram. Actually, the computer code, the, the printout, the 700-page printout of the incomprehensible code, is protected by copyright. But the functionality would be protectable by patent. But oh, that's a I process. See. Okay, that's like the process. block diagram of how it works. Exactly. But the code itself is copyrighted. Code itself be covered with copyright. Okay, and that's uh, in inventions; those are patentable. Right? Inventions are patentable. So the invention, in the case of software, would be the, the the functional process that tells you how to operate a computer. I guess maybe just as a variation of uh, that. What's uh, what about the recipe for these new wonder drugs and uh, modern medical well, miracles? The, 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 Recipes, technically, if you mean it in the food sense, which you're not speaking of, is yeah. not covered by anything yet, although there's agitation on the part of bartenders and chefs to get IP that covers recipes, just like there's agitation to get a, a type of copyright that covers fashion designs, which are currently not covered, and I'm sure that the perfume industry is coming next. Oh, yeah. uh, but in the pharmaceutical industry, the composition of a given pharmaceutical is covered under patent as a composition of matter. That's one of the three or four types of patents. You can get a patent on plants, asexually reproduced plants. You can get a patent on designs, which is a special type of patent. But the primary type of patent is a utility patent, which is a useful device, a machine or a process or a composition of matter or an improvement of something else. And the, what you just mentioned is a type of patent. Okay, is that, would that, uh, is it the, uh, which one of those processes, I guess it's probably copyright, that applies to if you go to a photographic uh, studio and they give you a picture and you take it to your local copying place and they say, oh no, this has got this uh, prohibition on it, that's a copyright. That, that, that's that copyright, and it's even worse than that. According to copyright law, the owner of the copyright of a photograph is the photographer. 
So if you're on vacation and you hand your camera to a stranger passing by to take a picture of you and your family, and you go home with that <laughs> snapshot, you don't own the copyright to it, and you don't know who does because <laughs> he's a stranger. Or if you hire a photographer to take a picture of you and your family, he owns the copyright, which is why you can't go down to uh, a copy shop and have it copied without risking thousands and thousands of dollars of penalties. Okay, we'll get into some more uh, esoteric things. What about the uh, logos on fashion merchandise and so forth? You see all these knockoff labels and every once in a while in Houston you'll read about a bust of uh, some place down <coughs> typically on Harwin Avenue where we have a lot of right. uh, a lot of uh, uh, Oriental and East uh, Asian goods coming so, in. So that would be covered by trademark law. Now trademark law uh, so copyright is designed to, expre uh, to cover the cop protect the expression, the original expression of an idea. Patents covers the uh, useful invention. Trademarks are supposed to just guarantee the authenticity of the source of a good. So the idea is rooted in fraud, that you cannot defraud a consumer. But the problem with trademark law is that if um, this knockoff purse maker down on Harwin sells a Louis Vuitton purse that's a fake purse, in almost every case, the consumer knows what they're buying. They're not being defrauded. They know they're buying an $18 Louis Vuitton purse that normally costs $3,000. <laughs> right. So they're not being defrauded. The person who can sue this knockoff company is not the consumer. It is actually Louis Vuitton. But Louis Vuitton is not being defrauded either. I see. So that's one of the problems with trademark laws is currently okay. implemented. To get into uh, maybe an even more esoteric area, which I seem to remember <coughs> reading that you talked about very briefly, and that's uh, somebody's reputation, that you don't really own your reputation, or rep uh, your reputation is not your intellectual property? Well, so the way this works is the, the four uh, classical types of IP or intellectual property are trademark, trade secret, um, and patent and copyright. So trade secret is just the ability to keep something secret and to protect it with the courts if it starts leaking out and if it's not made public yet. Um, the field of reputation rights, which is covered by defamation law, the two types of defamation law are libel and slander. Libel is the written form of defamation, and slander is the oral form of defamation. They're both basically making a statement public that is false and that damages someone's reputation. Now, that is covered under, as I say, reputation rights law or defamation law. Uh, that is not typically included under the umbrella of intellectual property, but in my view it should be because it's based upon the same theory and it's also fallacious for the same reasons that patent and copyright and the other types of rights are. Basically all these types of um, rights hold the view that people have a property right in the value of intangible things. And that is the fundamental mistake. Uh, the, the proper view that inform the original Western capitalist system is that there are things in the world that we need to use to be prosperous, but only one person can use these things at a time. They're scarce. They're scarce also. goods. So we have a property rights system that says who can use this thing in a peaceful, cooperative, productive way. Um, but you have a property right in the physical integrity of these objects, including your body. But you would never have the property right in the value of things because the value is what other people think about your, your reputation or how much your house is worth. And if they have a property right in the value or if you have a property right in the value, you can basically use the force of the state to keep people from acting in certain ways or thinking in certain ways that affects the value of your property. That's the fundamental mistake of all IP rights. I see. Uh, let me remind our viewers that uh, we will have a call-in session toward the end of uh, the uh, program will let uh, uh, Stefan talk a little bit more about some of his uh, more controversial views so that we can uh, stir up some uh, questions. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we talked, uh, I mentioned a little bit about what uh, the terms of the current copyright and, uh, and patent law is, but what's this uh, stuff about SOPA and uh, PIPA that's going around in the Congress? Uh, I guess is this to stop uh, pirating of uh, movies and software in uh, other yes. countries? Uh, is yeah. that what the basis for that is? It's part of it, and also to stop it here. Um, uh, let's back up a little bit and talk about, the, you asked earlier about what the, term, the origin of the term intellectual property. Um, the term intellectual property is a fairly recent term that has been used and introduced by advocates of patent and copyright, um, to say 100 years ago, who were on the fence because 
your typical advocate of the free market sees there's something a little bit problematic about the government granting monopolies that protect people from competition, which is what patent and copyright are. So the advocates of IP who are entrenched business interests started calling it property because property has a, a, a positive connotation in most people's Historical minds. Historical precedent. And now people are used to calling it property. Uh, and at the same time, they started calling um, a natural free market activity, which is competition, which involves seeing what someone else does that's successful and makes a profit, and you enter that market to compete with them. That requires imitation, emulation, and copying, or what you might call sharing. And sharing is nothing more than learning, and when you learn information, you repeat it or build on it or whatever. So the government has demonized these peaceful activities, sharing, competition, emulation, by calling them piracy and yeah, I mean, it's, stealing uh, yeah, and theft. Stealing, right. They, when, now, normally when you steal something from someone, they don't have it anymore. Or when you commit piracy, you board their ship and you shoot people and throw things overboard and ransack them and leave them worse off. Right. Uh, but nowadays, these pejorative terms, stealing and, and theft and piracy, are applied to people simply seeing something and using it to determine what to do with their own property. So what about SOPA and PIPA now? So what SOPA are those? and PIPA um, were uh, just the most recent in a long chain of attempts by the government at the behest of the special interest groups such as the, uh, the music industry, the RIAA, and the motion picture industry, the MPAA, um, to try to crack down on people sharing information which is especially easy nowadays since the advent of the internet since 1995 or so and the advent of digital um, information is, itself. Um, basically the internet is the world's most perfect and beautiful copying machine and you have all these business models that were based upon the difficulty of copying in the old age. Going back to the uh, monks in the uh, of course, monastery. Which, uh, is, which, which brings us back to the origin of copyright. Copyright arose as a response of the government and the church to the danger to them of the advent of the printing press because it made the copying of books easier and the spread of information to the regular people more easy and they were losing their gatekeeper control over what ideas could be presented to the average person which is why the stationer's company was chartered by the crown to have a monopoly over what books could be printed and then gradually that turned into the Statute of Anne in 1709, which is the first major copyright law. So copyright emerged as an attempt to control the spread of information. And that technology has only gotten more powerful as we've gone along and given more people the wherewithal uh, that didn't own a printing press <laughs> before right. uh, now own a computer or a copying machine. Now everyone's a printer and everyone can copy. <laughs> and <laughs> right. so SOPA stands for the Stop Online Piracy Act. Uh, it was the, uh, and its counterpart in the Congress was the PIPA, the Protect Online, uh, Protect IP Act. Uh, and they were both the spawn of uh, COICA, the Combating Online Infringements Copying Act, which died a couple of years ago, which was the spawn of another bill. And it just goes on and on. And even though, um, so, so the problem with SOPA was it would give the, the government uh, and even private interest in some incarnations of the bill the ability to simply make an allegation that a given website contained um, infringing content or even a link to infringing content. Um, and that allegation could go to a court in secret, that is without the, the, the website owner being notified. That was an ex parte hearing with no due process. And the court could issue an order to ISPs and Google and search engines telling them you have to remove all traces of this information from your, uh, from your system. So basically these, these websites would be cut off from the internet and you couldn't get to them unless you knew its actual IP address, which no one knows anymore. They just know the, sure. the, the, the numer alphanumerical uh, domain name. So the danger of this is that it would, it would result in what's called a, a, a blacklist or even a whitelist, a government controlled list of companies that are authorized to be on the internet which is exactly what is done in China and other repressive regimes that we pretend to be superior to. So uh, there was a really big danger that SOPA would basically break the architecture of the internet or give almost total control to the state and its special interest uh, groups. Um, and the internet rose up against it and defeated it, at least temporarily. But 
the problem is Obama had already signed ACTA, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, a couple of months before. No one even noticed except for a few of us. And that contains provisions similar to SOPA already. And as we speak, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is being negotiated in secret between the U.S. and several other Asian and other countries, which would require all these countries to adopt United States-style uh, copyright provisions similar to SOPA and similar to other bad laws that we have. See, I know uh, every once in a while I look for something on uh, Facebook uh, that I can, uh, from a Google or something, will send me to a, a page, and uh, when that page comes up, it'll say, uh, this page, this Facebook uh, video has been removed yes. because of an that, objection, I guess. Uh, that, that's removed. That someone under, can, so, uh, uh, so that's a result of the DMCA. I have a blog post on my website, c4sif.org, where I talk about death of freedom by acronyms because you can just list all the, I mean, you can you can leave out all the statutes with no acronyms. You have ICE and ITU and TPP and ACTA, COICA, PIPA, SOPA, Pro-IP Act. It's just unending. And the, the one you're talking about is DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was enacted in 19, I want to say 1998 uh, under Clinton. And at the dawn of the internet, um, the DMCA, which is a horrible law, the DMCA basically says it established this takedown procedure, which we're used to now. What it said was, if you're an ISP or an OSP, online service provider, and you're like a conduit of information, these people were afraid of liability for defamation and for copyright infringement. Like, for example, Yahoo might be afraid that if a user posts a copyrighted video without permission on their site, like just with a blog account or something, um, that, that Yahoo could be sued. So Congress responded to that and they said, we will give you um, a defense for copyright infringement and defamation if you establish a policy where if you get a complaint, then you take it down right away. So mm -hmm. that's why you see these videos being taken down. And, and, and at the time, the copyright lobby did not realize how powerful this exception would become. Um, it's called a safe harbor. Um, you know, they gave in on it because they were negotiating. But if that safe harbor had not been negotiated, it's possible that Facebook and YouTube and Google never could have blossomed like they did. And that's why, ever since then, the RIAA and the MPAA have been fighting to kill that safe harbor. They hate the safe harbor. What they want is they want a DMCA that has the safe harbor removed. They want the gatekeepers, the ISPs, to be liable. Um, and in fact, um, they are trying to impose DMCA type provisions on other countries through this TPP I mentioned or through ACTA. Um, another part of DMCA which is uh, really um, uh, disturbing is it actually outlaws what they call anti-circumvention technology, which is what I call a computer. Because, <laughs> if, in other words, if you have a, a piece of equipment that you could use to break the encryption on some copyrighted material, even if you have the right to break that encryption because of a fair use exception under the copyright law, even if you have the right to do it, if you have equipment that could be used to break encryption that is protecting copyrighted material, then it is illegal to have that. It's like contraband. In mm. other words, you're holding a piece of equipment that's like, like a narcotic. paraphernalia. It's paraphernalia. <laughs> but to my mind, that's every computer that we have now is theoretically an anti-circumvention device uh, under the DMCA. I see. Does the issue of uh, adult uh, websites and content play into this, or is that a totally different? Uh, well, item? it's. Um, uh, I'd say there's three big categories that the state uses to as an excuse to regulate the freedom of action among uh, uh, consenting adults on the internet, to use Nozick's phrase, uh, and that would be porn, especially kitty porn, child porn, uh, piracy, which is copyright infringement, and terrorism, of course. And so you have uh, uh, Obama signing the Indefinite Detention Act recently under the name of, of terrorism. Uh, we have mega uploads being shut down. Uh, we have the, the state saying that um, proceeds of piracy from third world countries and other countries is used to support terrorism. So they're using terrorism in combination with copyright law okay. as an excuse to shut down sites. Like the drug laws, I guess, to support exactly. terrorism. Exactly. And of course, yeah. gambling is another one. They're using gambling, yeah, gambling to, to shut down problem. people, you know, gambling $10 at a online poker machine because they they can't gamble in their states. So yeah, uh, the excuse of protecting the children is always trotted out as a, as a as a way to violate our liberties. 
And uh, I noticed from some of the uh, things, of course, I've uh, looked at some of the blogs that uh, you've been on, some of the responses and so forth. And of course, one of the, uh, the things that uh, seems, even to me in some ways, counterintuitive is this idea of protecting uh, value. You know, if I spend uh, 10 years writing a software program and uh, uh, am selling it and everybody has the right to copy it and send it to their friends or send it overseas or whatever else, in some way it makes me feel like right. uh, I've, uh, I've screwed up. I've, right. uh, <laughs> and, and not only that I've screwed up, but that if I knew that was going to happen, maybe I would have never right. invested my effort in that to begin with. And I know that's not necessarily an intellectual argument against it, but it is a consequence that most people uh, think of with people spending yeah. millions of dollars to uh, make uh, uh, first run movies or, yes. or, or write books or anything yes. that they're somehow or other their value is being stolen. Well, there, there's a there's a, a interesting little uh, logo I have on my website. It's a, it's a little Aeroflot symbol, and it says, "Your failed business model is not my problem." <laughs> you know, but what that what that gets at is that in any society, an entrepreneur has to be aware of the possibility of free riders, um, and they have to try to come up with a creative way to make a profit, despite the fact of some things are being easily copied and some things are not. So, as a simple example, in the in the 50s, when the drive-in movie theaters were initially popular. Uh, one problem, according to, according to Apocrypha, is that um, you could have free riders sit on the neighboring hills and watch the movie for free because it was outdoors, and they could listen to it because there were loudspeakers behind the screens. <laughs> and so these guys had the bright idea, well, let's pay a little money and install little speakers on little speakers, poles yeah. by every car. Now, that's probably not as good of a solution, and it's probably cost money, but they found a way. They didn't go to the government to say, make it a, a, a federal crime to sit on a hill and watch a movie. They just came up with a way to, and in fact, every business has locks on the doors and at the movie theaters, they have uh, tellers that take the tickets to make sure you only come in if you buy a ticket. These things cost money. So every business model, the entrepreneur has to find a way to make a profit. If you can't find a way to make a profit, probably that's not something you should be involved in. But I believe the reality is that almost every practice we're used to in today's society could exist in a in a free society absent copyright and patent, primarily because um, um, t taxes would be so much lower. We would all be so much more wealthy. We'd have so much so little few regulations if the government were stripped down to such a small size that he couldn't impose patent and copyright. That we'd have it, just an excess of money for research and development and for investing in movies. Um, there is no reason to believe, for example, that. Uh, a blockbuster movie couldn't be made. Maybe Tom Cruise would be paid five million instead of twenty million. Uh, but you sell tickets, people go to the movie theater and they watch it. And then if it's pirated after that, you, you've made a lot of money. Um, for example, let, let's take Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling, a very popular author, she's probably worth second or first richest woman in England now. Maybe she wouldn't be worth half a billion dollars in a free society. Maybe she's worth ten million. I don't know. But I think she'd have an incentive to write Harry Potter because she wrote it as an unemployed welfare mom, right? Because she loved right. the characters. So let's imagine she writes the first Harry Potter book and she sells it on Amazon and is pirated soon after that because it's popular. She makes a little money, but not as much as she could have. She had a monopoly, but she becomes wildly popular as she did in real life. Well, then she publishes a second novel and she sells more, but she's still pirated. Well, then she says, listen, I've got 17 million fans around the world. Uh, I've got the third novel written. As soon as you guys, as soon as I get a million people pledge $10 each to buy the book, I'll release it. Uh -huh. So she makes $10 million that way. And then someone wants to make a movie of it. There might be four people making a movie of the first Harry Potter novel at the same time because they don't need her permission if there's no copyright. But maybe one of these studios says, you know, I bet if we get Harry Potter on board and to give her authorization and to consult, that we will get more of the fans to come see our version rather than the, the other unauthorized versions. So they offer to pay her $5 million to be a consultant. I mean, these things don't occur to people now because they can rest upon the copyright and the patent monopoly. But in a free society, there's no end to the creativity that entrepreneurs could and would resort to to make a profit off of their ingenuity and creativity. Has the uh, music uh, industry come up with a uh, more or less successful business model to, uh, uh, to, come, uh, to realize that uh, Copying songs is uh, is not a major technological problem. I was out with someone the other night, 
who held up their cell phone where there was a song playing. Uh, they didn't know what the name of it was. They held up their, uh, their cell phone, yep. which evidently had a, some kind of a voice recognition. Sh Shazam, and the name of the right? song yep. came on yep. the uh, cell phone screen, and they said, oh, I think I'll download yep. that. I like that song. Yep. Went to some free download site and downloaded yep. the song. Yep. I think, um, I think, in a way, the music industry has not come up with a way. And in a way, I think that's a good thing. Uh, the question is, what about artists? Artists have always been uh, basically uh, exploited by the, and same same with publishers. Well, so, uh, most uh, authors and most artists don't make a lot of money. They do it for the passion. Right? You're talking about visual artists as opposed to vocal artists. Even musicians, uh, 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 Madonna and Sting may be exceptions. Um, uh, Stephen King may be an exception. Uh, J.K. Rowling. But your typical author or your typical musician. They don't make a lot of money. The, re the record industry or the publishing company keeps a huge degree of the profit. And they had this oligopolistic position that was created in part built upon the superstructure of the copyright law. What I think is happening now is with Amazon and with the threat of piracy, which is real even though it's illegal, um, and with the internet and digital publishing, the Kindle, etc., you have artists and authors now that can basically go around these gatekeepers. They can go around the big publishers. They can go around the uh, the, the the music industry self publish I think uh, self publish of, uh, and values. I think so I think in the terms in the case of music I think the problem for artists has been solved and that is if you sell a lot of or if you even get have a lot of music free music downloads of your latest song and you get a reputation and you become popular that's going to help you sell tickets at a concert so of course um, as Cory Doctorow who's a science fiction author in favor of Creative Commons and open culture he said um, it may be a challenge to find a way to make a profit in a world where information is easy to copy, but he doesn't know of anyone who can make a profit off of obscurity. In other <laughs> words, the, the real threat to any author in this huge world of millions of performers and people, you want to get noticed. You know, you want your stuff to get copied. You want to be, and then then you can figure out how to make a profit off of it. But if no yeah. one knows who you are because you keep it trapped, kind of like a search engine uh, philosophy, right? It's like a search engine <laughs> philosophy, sure. <laughs> if people start using your search engine, uh, you can start figuring out how to make sure. it uh, pay some money. I mean, why, why do academics publish papers and journals? They don't get paid for this. Sometimes they have to pay. They do it for their reputation to. Uh, to help beef their resume up, to get a job teaching at a university. Uh, there's almost every field you can think of, you can try to th see how people would gravitate towards using their creativity to enhance their lives in some way, whether it's monetary or not. Okay. Well, let me remind our viewers that uh, feel free to call in and ask uh, Stefan any questions that uh, may arise. I'm sure uh, some of his remarks have uh, stimulated uh, some of your thinking on that area, like they have mine. So I'll try to ask uh, uh, as many questions as I can think of that came up with. But uh, one of the things that uh, maybe is uh, also somewhat interesting is not necessarily uh, continuing in the same vein, but to talk about the uh, political landscape as it relates to uh, intellectual property concerns. Uh, people on the left versus people on the right. People on the right obviously are usually pretty strong property mm -hmm. rights uh, mm -hmm. proponents and uh, sometimes people on the left who are, well if they're hardcore uh, socialists or some point they actually believe that you know everybody owns everything and there is no private property. So how is that uh, well, thing we take, playing out in the political landscape? If we take mainstream politics into account you see very little difference between Republicans and Democrats. Um, uh, you know, all the mainstream Republican and Democratic congressmen are all in favor of intellectual property, primarily because they're in the pockets of Hollywood and the music industry. Um, and they also sort of foster and accept the myth that patent and copyright are important types of property rights. Um, now, you have some exceptions like, say, Rand Paul and Ron Paul and, and Senator Ron Wyden, who even if they support the idea of patent and copyright to some degree because it's in the Constitution, they recognize that there's a tension between freedom of speech and Internet freedom. Uh, so they oppose SOPA and PIPA, for example, because they go too far, they say. Um, now, if you talk about political theory, there is almost a uh, mistaken notion on the left and the right about IP. They both accept the same wrong premise. Both the left and the right believe the myth that intellectual property is a type of Western capitalist property right. 
And for that reason, the right wing supports it. And for that reason, the left wing opposes it. So the left wing's against property rights, and therefore they're against patent and copyright. The right wing says they're in favor of property rights, and therefore they support intellectual property rights because it's a type of property right. The problem is they're both wrong. Intellectual property is not a type of property right. It actually goes against property rights. So once you recognize that, uh, the left should, uh, the, well, at least the right should oppose it because it undercuts property rights. And the, left, the left is confused on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on which leftist you're okay. talking about. The left well, libertarians are good on this issue, I have to say. I see. Well, once uh, these uh, protection uh, uh, periods expire, then you really have a society like you're talking about, right? Yes. I and mean, uh, yes, and we, would be we see. We see. I think James Joyce's works just came into the public domain uh, a month ago. Who? I'm sorry. James who? Joyce. Oh, James Joyce. Ulysses, yeah. etc. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the Supreme Court decided on the same day that SOPA was defeated a month ago, the Supreme Court decided in a case that the United States government, the Congress, had the power to take works that had previously gone into the public domain. I mean, they had been copyrighted for 50 years, and they finally went into the public domain, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. Um, we're talking uh, uh, orchestral works, things like this. They went into the public domain. Within the United States passed um, one of these uh, international treaties which required us to add 20 years onto the term. And so Congress recently implemented that. So the question was, th which means some works that had been public domain for 20 years, they've been performed by church groups and choirs around the country, et cetera, all of a sudden became back into the, pub uh, the, the private, private domain. domain. And uh, which means, you know, I had a concert plan next week. Now I've got to go find whoever the owner is and get their permission, and maybe they can stop me. I've got to pay royalties. I've had all these things printed up. So at this, on the same day that SOPA was defeated, uh, the Supreme Court said it's constitutional for the Congress to put works back into the private domain. Wow. Okay. Well, we got a caller. Uh, let me see uh, what one of our viewers. Uh, good evening, viewer. Do you have a question for our guest this evening? Uh, yeah, I have a question. I'm interested uh, in, you know, what happened. The upload, and uh, you know, it, is this going to set a trend? Maybe on how uh, you know, you know what happened. The FBI shut it down, or or whatever happened there. So is this going to, you know, was that the first of its kind to be kind of shut down, or uh, I don't know, any comments about what happened with Mega Upload? Okay, I got the question. Uh, he, he, the caller is asking about Mega Upload. Let me let me give a little history of that. Mega Upload was one of these sites that allowed uh, people to share files on a website similar to YouTube in a way, similar to um, Dropbox in a way. Um, and uh, the owner of it was uh, in a New Zealand, and he was, had a, this weird mansion. He was a rich guy. He seemed like a James Bond villain almost. He had a weird name. He, he changed his last name to .com, actually. <laughs> and and uh, the FBI um, basically st strong-armed the uh, Hong Kong and the New Zealand uh, uh, police and one of the country's police and about a month ago, two months ago, 69 federal and other agents swarmed in on this compound in New Zealand. I mean, American FBI agents swarmed in with the cooperation of local law enforcement, uh, I mean, with helicopters and SWAT teams and just like a complete blitz, and swooped in and arrested the top four guys um, for pirating um, movies. They shouldn't have been pirating, things like that. Um, it's not the first, and I think the, uh, last year alone, over one or 200 domain names were seized by ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, Agency of the federal government, the Justice Department. Um, you can find these websites. If you go to their domains, you'll see a big ominous federal warning with the, um, the, the federal seal saying this has been just taken down. Um, recently, a, um, a British and English um, student was accused by American authorities of having a link on his website in Britain that linked to another site that had pirated copy, and they have convinced a British court to allow him to be extradited to the United States for criminal charges. Uh, in, the, in the last few months, a, a, a man who uploaded one copy of the Wolverine movie, uploaded to the, to the Internet, was convicted and sentenced to federal prison for one year. Now, uploading a file. So this, this is not the first of its kind. Uh, WikiLeaks, of course, was shut down uh, about a year ago. The Pirate Bay is always on the run. And the fear now is that 
with mega uh, mega uploads shut down that le- so-called legitimate sites like you send you send it and Dropbox and YouTube and other sites like this are going to have to uh, uh, be shut down or maybe the owners face federal federal prison time for having a website that's a useful service. Um, in fact, several overseas websites that were doing a similar type of file sharing service now have blocked the United States. So if you're in the U.S. and you have a U.S. Uh, IP address and you log into this site, it says, sorry, we no longer serve United States citizens. So we're being treated like the opposite of how China treats its citizens now. <laughs> uh, it's, it's getting really scary and dangerous. Okay, well, we got another caller here. Uh, yes, uh, caller, you have a question for our guest? Yes, I do have a question. Um, what happens about there are artists that like to release their music free through like sites like a media fire and such? Will that affect artists from releasing their own music for free for their fans to enjoy? With the recent, uh, I guess, shutdown of Mega Upload and some of these torrent sites and, and whatnot? Yes, the caller has a good point. Um, um, of course, it, it, an artist who creates his own song, you, you have the copyright in it, unless you're sampling or remixing what someone else did, in, ca- case you may be tr- in which case you may be in trouble. But assuming you were the creator of a song, you have the right to release it under whatever license you want, so you could use a Creative Commons license. The problem is, uh, if, you, if you don't want to use your own website and you want to use one of these services, then the service has to be in existence. And the problem is, sites like Mega Upload and um, uh, similar sites some of the material is what you're talking about. It's legitimate, and some of the material is pirated. And so if the government determines that it's primarily you know, illegitimate, they're going to shut the whole thing down. And so the problem is these sites have no ability to know whether the song you upload is legitimate or not. So it would cost them too much money to let you upload songs for free and then figure out and monitor whether or not you're legitimate. So they're just going to shut down the whole service, I believe. So I believe these services or in jeopardy because of um, actions against mega upload and similar actions of the federal government in the name of copyright. In the name of property right, property rights are being jeopardized. Uh, One of the things when I uh, rent a movie or something, there's always this very ominous screen that comes on at the uh, start of the movie saying, warning. I'm not even sure what all the rest of the text is because I don't (laughs) necessarily. But what... uh, what are the penalties? Uh, I mean, if I, as a private citizen, decide that, oh, well, this, I can figure out how to copy this uh, movie, and I do so, and, you know, give it to some of my friends or something, what the, uh, the, sort the, of... The, uh, the penalties can be civil fines and even jail time, as I mentioned in the Wolverine case. Um, and the rules are so arbitrary and ridiculous. There's a, there's a ruling by the, I think it's the FCC that makes this one, that says that... Um, if your television is more than 55, inch, 55 inches in, in, in um, oh, diagonal in length, <laughs> you cannot use it to show the Super Bowl at a church event. I mean, literally. So if you want to have your church people come and watch the Super Bowl, you can do it, but only if your TV is 55 inches or smaller. Um, so there's all these Presumably rules. that keeps your audience down if you can't. There's a reason it behind than... it, but, you know, it's obviously yeah, no, technologically I mean, obviously. bound. Um, but there was one law professor, his name is John Tehrani, and he did, a, he, he did an estimate of what your potential civil liability is for violating copyright. If you're a typical young, middle-aged person who uses the Internet on a regular basis, but you're not a big pirate type, you never try to go to the pirate bay, but let's say you send emails to friends, you copy things from the Internet, um, he estimated that the average person who just uses the Internet on a regular basis is theoretically liable for up to $4.5 billion of fines every year. Now, it seems like a joke, but it's, uh-huh. it is a joke, but it's true. Uh, now, 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 maybe it would be only a billion, <laughs> okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> but this is, this is uh, it, 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 to, to my mind, it shows that the copyright clause is in, is in tension with the First Amendment, which protects freedom of speech and expression, it's in conflict with the Eighth Amendment, which protects excessive fines and cruel and unusual punishment, because how can uploading a few files and forwarding a few emails to people justify a billion dollars of penalties? It's clearly an excessive fine under the Eighth Amendment. And then you also have a due process problem with the Fifth Amendment. And if you remember, the, the Bill of Rights, which has these amendments, the First, the Fifth, and the Eighth Amendment, 
was enacted in 1791, two years after the Constitution was ratified. So the Constitution had the copyright clause in 1789. Two years later came the Bill of Rights. Now my belief is that at least three of the Bill of Rights uh, are inconsistent with the, the copyright clause. And since they came later, they overrule it. So my view is that the copyright clause is very likely unconstitutional. Hmm. Interesting approach. Um, one of the terms that I uh, came across in, uh, in looking at some of your stuff on the Internet already was the term uh, patent troll. Can yes. you tell us what a patent troll is? A patent troll uh, is, is based upon the, uh, the idea of a troll who, you know, uh, sits under a bridge. Lives under and, a bridge and yeah, waits and, for things and to go to, by. To cross the bridge, you have to pay a fine. So the idea of a patent troll is that someone, um, l let me back up and explain how patents normally work. Let's say I come up with an invention, uh, a new mousetrap, and let's say I manufacture that mousetrap. Um, and I'm selling the mousetrap and I have a patent on the mousetrap. I can prevent competitors from making a similar mousetrap. I can sue them. Uh, but who would I normally sue if I'm a mousetrap maker? I'm suing another mousetrap maker. Now, they may have their own patents on their own mousetraps, and I may be violating one of their patents. So I sue them, they sue me back, and we both rattle our sabers, and we settle with each other, and we go back to business. Maybe I pay him a little, maybe he pays me a little. The problem with this is people on the outside who don't have patents can't even compete with us, so we establish a monopoly or an oligopoly. Um, but everyone seems to think this is fair. Well, if, if I sue you for my patents, I'm suing a competitor, and I'm, I'm risking the chance that you might countersue me, so it's a little bit fair. I, I get to sue you, but I have to take the risk that you sue me back. Well, a patent troll is someone who, let's say, buys the patent from my competitor, but they're not making any mousetraps. They just own this patent. And all they do is they go around seeing people that make a mousetrap that arguably is covered by their patent, and they just sue them. Well, if someone that owns a patent sues me, but they don't, they're, not, they're not a competitor, I can't countersue them for anything. So it's unfair. I have no defense. I just have to give in. Um, but in my view, actually, the animus against patent trolls is misplaced because at least the patent troll just wants money. He has nothing to gain from in getting an injunction against me and shutting me down because then I'm not selling anything and he gets no royalty. He just wants a cut. Okay. So if I'm selling um, um, an Android phone, and a troll sues me for violating his patent, he's going to want a little cut of every Android phone I sell. But if Apple sues me, who is not a troll, then they're going to want to get an injunction and shut me down. And in fact, they've been doing that. They, they've succeeded in getting injunctions against uh, some Galaxy tab maker, Samsung uh, tablets and some uh, Android phones in other countries around the world based upon their patents. So in a way, trolls are less dangerous I see. than actual patent uh, actual inventors. In many cases, I, or not in many cases, but at least in some cases, you see uh, uh, economic transactions going on in the world of technology where uh, somebody uh, will buy uh, or you know, in some way merge with or absorb another company yes. who obviously is not doing well or has right. a failed business model, yes. and yet they have this storehouse of yep. patents that they have as a part of their business. Yes. And does that explain why sometimes these companies are valued a lot higher than you yes. would think if they had a business model that doesn't seem to be working out? Yeah, some recent examples of that would be um, um, uh, uh, Google's purchase of Motorola Mobility for their 17 or 26,000 patents. Oh, yeah. And Co right. Kodak is basically bankrupt, and they're just trying to sell themselves off of their patents, which are huge. They may be sold for one or two or three billion dollars just for their patent portfolio. Uh, Android, I'm sorry, Apple, I believe, purchased about a year ago um, uh, thousands of patents from IBM. IBM is a huge patent powerhouse. Uh, and they're all doing this to have weapons against each other and to keep the little guy out. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that, that's a big part of it. And it's, uh, it's sad that you have these companies spending literally hundreds of millions or billions of dollars on acquiring patents just to counter sue each other so they have the right to keep operating. Uh, when the uh, only effect of it is to raise prices for the consumer and to stop competition from smaller companies on the outside who see raised barriers to entry. It's anti-competitive and it's uh, monopolistic. Do you have any uh, advice that you would uh, care to give to aspiring uh, 
songwriters and authors and or computer software uh, designers who would be living in this new world of uh, no IP protection? Sure. Uh, I mean, I would say they're already living in that world because, uh, at least for copyrights, uh, piracy is rampant, and uh, I don't think the government will be able to stop it. There is just too much uh, ability of people to uh, pirate things. So whether or not copyright is around, people that make their living off of creating copyrighted type works have to face the fact that there are a lot of people out there that will be able to get their content without paying for it. That's just the fact of reality. So they have to come up with a business model to face facts and to, to work around that. And there are a lot of techniques uh, people are using. They're using things like Kickstarter, kickstarter.com, which you can go to to help get funding for a project. Um, there is a video game company. Um, I blogged about it the other day. I'm forgetting their name. Um, they're a, a very popular video game company, and they wanted to revive an old type of adventure-style video game, which is not really popular right now. They couldn't get a big uh, video game publisher to back it. So they went on Kickstarter, and they said, we need, oh, I think they wanted um, $300,000 uh, pledged within a month to make sure they had enough money pledged from potential customers of this game to fund its development over a three- or six-month period. And within a day or two, they had over a million dollars pledged so there are ways that you can have pro projects What did funded. these investors see as the uh, benefit for putting up this million dollars? Well, do you know? Well, the, the primary benefit is to make sure that the company met its threshold so they would make this game, then they would be able to get the game, whether they pirate it or buy it. And it was like $10 for the bottom level, and there was a tier of benefits that the company offered for different levels of, of investment. There was even a $25,000 level investment, I believe, and if you did that, they would put your character into the game. So, and you know, for the mid-level, $100, you would get a free poster and you'd get advanced copies of the, of the documentary they're shooting during the filming of it. So these guys are being creative and they're using their control over the process to offer something of value to different types of people. But they locked it in and, you know, once they make their million dollars on this, they're already four times more than they originally needed. Everything else is, is gravy or lanyap, as you say in Louisiana, right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, if people pirate it now, it doesn't cost you anything. You've already locked in your... So there are different things that uh, producers can do. I'm thinking just as we're uh, talking about this <coughs> that uh, certainly advertising must uh, start to play a major uh, sure. role in this. If I'm writing a, uh, a video game or something, the fact that I would have some recognizable product as being either a, attributable to a character or some of course. scenario in the game uh, might uh, right. bring the funding from from that advertiser. Right, and even to, even um, if, you know, there's the phenomena of uh, freeware and freemium, you know, where you give one version away for free for people that want to dabble with it or can't afford the bigger product, and you sell a license for support and for premium products to other people. There's, yeah, there's shareware, all kinds of, is that the, is freeware and shareware the same thing? Or? Yeah, yeah, it, it, the freemium is like, there's the, the first version is for free, or if you want to get support, uh, uh, you know, on the website, then you pay a little bit more, or maybe they encourage you to just donate to the company. Yeah, I know in a couple of cases in Shareware, they said if you use this Shareware practice, if you find this Shareware useful and you yes. use it, please send $5 yep. to uh, such and such. There uh, are some donation models. There are some models where you pay, uh, you know, you may see a good app on the I iOS store, and you may see the, the name of the company that designed it. It may be a free app. And you may want to have an app developed for your business. You may hire that company. So it's advertising for their services. I mean, there's just so many ways that your reputation is enhanced by getting your name out there. You may get a job with a company because you have a, a song or a program you've written or a book you've published or an article you've published, which you didn't get a cent for, but it helps you get a job. Let's see. Does, uh, does the topic we're talking about uh, uh, tonight, and I... Uh, <coughs> Conjure, the word pirate conjures up uh, the phenomenon of pirate radio, uh, which I guess was more prevalent in the UK, although maybe it's still, uh, I think there's some freak part of the frequency that uh, can still be used by entrepreneurs without getting a mm -hmm. FCC license. But does the idea of pirate radio and the spectrum have something to do with real property, or does that fall into a more I think that's a that's a um, well I think that's uh, somewhat related but a different area of free market thought and uh, I think the similarity is that the state involvement has screwed up that area too but it's not too related to um, intellectual property um, unless you believe that the airwaves right the frequency the spectrum is not a scarce resource 
Um, I think Which it is, right? I think most economists and I would agree that it is a scarce resource because it is something that's uh, part of the physical world that can only be used if by I one, use it, you can. Right. It can only be used by one person at a time. And in fact, in the early part of the uh, 18, uh, 1900s, the 20th century, uh, common law rules were developing that were giving co property rights in homesteading like easements almost. You know, if one guy popped up a radio station in a given area and it had a certain signal strength and went a certain geographic distance over a certain wave band over a certain wavelength, um, then he had a property. He had homesteaded that. Um, and these rules were developing when the FCC was formed and the government came in and just basically preempted the whole field and took it over. Um, if the government hadn't taken it over, they wouldn't be auctioning off things now and the government controlling it all and being subject to the, we wouldn't have had the fairness doctrine. The government wouldn't have been able to say, this is a public resource that, you know, we have to marshal for the public's benefit, et cetera. Uh, it would have been a private resource. Um, there is an analog in the oil and gas field, which is that in the United States, on private state lands, the minerals underneath private property are owned by the surface estate owner. Whether it's unitized or you can or sell them if you want to as yeah, well. Yeah, you, you can, can lease it, but basically it, it, there is a private owner. Sure. So if if, if you're a, a, a Exxon and you want to go drill on someone's land, you got to get their permission. Well, everywhere else in the world, every other country that I'm aware of, and in the United States in the federal offshore continental shelf, the federal lands, and on federal lands onshore, um, the government presumes to own all this, and they give leases. So the government has stepped in where something would have been private, and they've nationalized it, which is what the government does, say, in China for regular land. Sure. You know, if you want to build a factory in China, you go get a lease from the government. You don't really own the land. So basically, the government's involvement in oil and gas rights in the federal case and in the spectrum is a type of social socialization or nationalization of what should be a private resource. Yeah, and I think the <coughs> experience, unfortunately, uh, when the government gets to own all the subterranean rights, then the issue of taxation becomes less an issue in some of these countries because the government can use the oil revenues to fund Absolutely. whatever kind of an oppressive uh, exactly. regime that exactly. they uh, may want to put in, into place. As so, we see in well, Saudi Arabia and Iraq yeah, and UAE, et cetera stray from our individual intellectual Well, think about property. the BP case. You know, when BP had the oil spill in the Gulf, okay, they messed up. But they weren't, they were just the tenant of the federal government. The federal government was the lessee, the lessor. Hmm. Normally, if you have someone who owns land and they let someone come on their land to make a profit drilling for oil, and there's a big oil spill that spills onto your neighbor's land, all your neighbors are going to sue the landowner. In this case, it was the federal government. Of course, the federal government stepped out of the picture, and everyone blames it on BP. Yeah. They're just the, uh, uh, you know, the tenant of the federal government. Okay. Well, Stephen Kinsella, let me uh, thank you. Uh, we uh, kind of closed down our uh, show for this evening. Let me encourage our viewers to uh, visit your website, uh, which we've had on uh, up on the screen a number of times, and uh, communicate with you or uh, just learn from what you, the research. Uh, you've done. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Houston Media Source, uh, who makes these facilities available to us, and especially our uh, friend and uh, producer, Mark Pertle, who's always uh, a joy to work with here. And we look forward to uh, creating some interest in these general kinds of public policy issues, and uh, maybe we can uh, have you back on a future show if, uh, if some more of this legislation comes up in sure. Congress that we need to uh, rally support or at least understanding. Be happy uh, to. Thank, thank you very, very much, much, David. And we need to sit here and just